Well, good evening from Seattle. Uh, good late uh, afternoon in Dallas and good night in uh, Philadelphia. My name is Jens Chapman. On behalf of the Seattle Science Foundation, it's a huge honor to welcome you to this inaugural session of an evening with a spine surgeon. And uh, if we can switch to the slides, it's a great honor to present and introduce uh, Dr. Alexander Vaccaro um, uh, for this inaugural session, uh, A Life in Spine. Ben, can you forward, please? And again, the three questions that uh, Jack, who I really want to credit with the conception of this, are as, this is a chance to get to know true masters and how do they do it, what drives them, and who are they? And Ben, if you can advance, please. And so we thought we'd start at the top, uh, according to Expertscape, meet the most interesting spine surgeon in the world, the unequivocal number one, uh, according to Expertscape, and this is none less than Dr. Alex Vaccaro. Cool, suave, and smooth. Ben, please go ahead. And a, a star spine surgeon who is leading us to spine paradise amongst the leading other actors with his good looks and his incredible charm. And yes, the, the George Clooney has nothing on you. He's obviously an accomplished global academician. I think uh, this is uh, just a small vignette of appearances with internationally leading spine surgeons from all continents of the world. And he is uh, also a PhD from one of the most uh, established, oldest universities in the world, Utrecht in the Netherlands. You see him here as one of the uh, adjudicators for doctoral theses. And next, please. Um, he is an amazing family man. One of the things that, as much as he's willing to share with us, is how can he balance this incredible success as a leader of the Rothman Institute uh, with being a team doctor, with being an academician, a, a, a very accomplished businessman, and a very cool family man. I could personally see that. And he is also unequivocally, and hit the button again, Ben, the top spine influencer. This is a famous video, a, a day in the life of Alex Vaccaro. And yes, this is not a mistake, 3.30 a.m. Uh, I thought I'm tough at 4.30 a.m., but I got nothing on Alex again. 2.4 million views. That's pretty cool. So uh, this is uh, so cool to have you here. Um, I'll pass off to Dr. Jack Ziegler from the TBI to kind of give a more formal introduction on the bio of Alex, and then we'll jump right into questions and a uh, uh, chat format. So, Jack? Thanks, Jens. And uh, I'll be brief and hopefully uh, less embarrassing than, uh, than Jens' introduction, Alex. But, um, you know, in a field that has a lot of stars and superstars, uh, Alex is kind of a supernova. Um, he's uh, just been the brightest uh, star in the sky. So, um, you know, we're just really happy to kick this off with him and, and uh, happy that he was able to find the time for us. If you can go to the next slide. So Alex, um, just uh, super brief. Um, uh, he was an overachiever from a very young age, obviously graduated uh, with his bachelor's degree and his MD, both with honors. He did his residency um, at Thomas Jefferson, his spine fellowship with Dr. Steve Garfin, who is with us tonight. Um, and then Alex went on and got a, a couple more advanced degrees. He got a PhD in spine trauma and an MD, MBA. He is a past president of the American Spinal Injury Association because spinal injury is uh, kind of deep in his DNA um, as it is mine. And he's the only orthopedic surgeon on the editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgery. So, um, you know, and that's just, as I said, uh, a very small amount. So Alex and I have been friends for a long, long time. And uh, this, we took this picture in uh, uh, Hawaii, God, a long time ago. That kid is probably 30 years old now, Alex, uh, right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, one of my favorite pastimes is whenever I'm watching an Eagles uh, game and uh, there's a screenshot, I kind of grab it. And I've watched Alex age, if you can hit the next one and just going by the color of his hair, you can see and one more of this, the, the, you can follow him chronologically uh, as, <laughs> as life has kind of bared down on him. Uh, so next slide and um, we'll get going. And this is meant to be kind of informal. It's really a way to, for us to learn a little bit more about um, spine surgeons that we look up to. And what I thought we'd do is spend a little bit of time asking Alex if he'd you know, tell us a little bit about his earlier background and uh, motivation and you know, what kind of family um, uh, relationships he had that encouraged him to succeed. And then kind of in the middle, talk a little bit about his favorite uh, uh, research projects, whether they're basic science or clinical, just the, the couple of projects that he's the most proud of. 
And then towards the end, um, if he can share some tips and tricks on, on one or two of his favorite uh, operations. And in between, we'll kind of pepper him with uh, some questions from the gallery here, and as well as questions that are, are sent in from the chat room. So again, it's meant to be informal, and we just really kind of want to learn a little bit more about um, a guy that we all admire. So uh, once again, uh, Alex, if you, uh, I don't think we'll have any problem um, encouraging you to, to talk to us. So. So, Go for it, man. Thank you. So first of all, Jack and, and Jens, thank you. That was so uh, humbling, the introduction. I, I don't deserve it, um, but I love it. And I want to thank you guys. You guys are both great friends of mine. We've laughed, we've cried, we've experienced every human emotion together, and we will continue to do so in the future. And I want to pay homage to Steve, Steve Garfin. Um, I look at my life and I look at the four men that have been the most influential in my development my father, Jerry Kotler. Dick Rothman and Stephen Garfin. And it's the formative years. You know, and they say you develop your personality by the time you're six months to one year old. I became who I am in spine surgery because of those four leaders in my life. My dad was the hardest working man I've ever met in my life. He, you, <laughs> we would all hang out in the den together. We had six kids in the family and he would have a desk in the TV room and he would work nonstop. He'd come home from work, we'd have dinner. He'd go to his desk and he'd work all night long while we watched Carol Burnett, while we watched all the different shows. And he would work until he went to bed, never drank alcohol, drank about 10 cups of coffee a night. Uh, Thomas Jefferson University, where I met Garfin and where I met uh, Kotler and, and Rothman. Kotler, a workaholic, as Jack knows, he was a a big proponent of spinal trauma. He's the one that got me interested in spine surgery, him and Howard on. Howard on was my fellow. I was an intern and no one wanted to do spine surgery. And Jefferson was so busy as a spinal cord injury center. And I would always say, I'll do it. So he and I would just operate all day long. And he'd be like, hey, I know you're, I know you're a first year resident, but let me show you how to pass sublaminar wires. I'm like, oh my God. Hey, let me show you how to put a pedicle screw in. Oh my God, I'm a first year resident. This is unbelievable. So Howard on, let me go. And then Dick Rothman taught us how to be leaders. He taught us, and one of the interesting things, which I always laughed about my first year in orthopedics, he said, you have to learn how to be a public speaker and you have to learn how to do sound bites. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He goes, I'm gonna show you. So on Saturday mornings, he would hire these professional speakers to come in and they'd put you in a chair in front of everybody. They'd walk up and go, they'd say something like, did you know there was an accident in front of the hospital? And did you know that four patients were, were run over? What do you think about that? I'd be like, what? What are you talking about? He goes, no, no, Alex, you have to answer that question in 30 seconds, get it out and make the audience feel good. So Rothman pushed us to get up, to speak your mind. And then he was a businessman. I mean, he had, he, he fought the dean. He, he broke away from the university. I mean, what chairman says to the dean, yeah, I think I'm gonna privatize. You know what that usually means? You're out of a job. So Rothman privatized the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and fought all the battles for our department to allow us to become who we are today. And what I learned from him is that things don't always go well. I mean, there's ups and downs. There's no storied career. No matter how good you think you are or how good you have it, you're gonna fall tomorrow. Pride comes before the fall. It was 19, it was 2000, and Dick Rothman began to develop the first equity move in orthopedics where he sold the company to SCN, and it was a 30-year equity roll-up, and I didn't know anything about it. I was like three three years into practice, and I'm like, what, what do you mean I'm selling myself to private equity for the next 30 years? What, what do you mean there's a 25 to 30% scrape of my salary? Well, I don't understand anything mean. And of course, that looked like a good idea for about six and a half minutes until it tanked and we all went bankrupt and we all had nothing. So for three or four years, we were working our tails off bankrupt. So I always say what goes around comes around and we just reinvent the next model of academic and financial tragedy in our lives. So he taught me when you get knocked down, it's not the fact that you're standing, it's the fact that you can able to stand up again and fight the fight. So I said, it's all my residents and fellows, no matter how bad it gets out there, tomorrow will be a brighter day. And it's not the victories that you learn from, it's all the failures you learn from. 
And then, um, and then I became what I consider a very caring spine surgeon from Steve Garfin. Steve had a very open mind. Uh, he allowed us to, again, innovate, experiment, do things that we needed to do. I, um, we got a lot of autonomy at the VA hospital. I worked Yeah, I think this is Alex's internet. Oh so God, did, I, did you lose me? <clears throat> Intermittently, yeah. You got to get a better my, carrier. That's all right. My, my, my internet stinks in my house. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Thank God. It's going to do that all night long. Uh -uh. Alex, you need to get better internet. <laughs> oh God! How about now? Yes, good. Okay. okay, put your. I could see you guys. Put your thumb up whenever my internet goes out. Okay. You're okay. Good. Put, put up. So anyway, so he gave me the hunger to pursue academic medicine, and and academic medicine is an interesting thing. It, things don't always go your way. I've seen so many great. Okay, I'm gonna stick this thing in the side here. How's that? Better. Okay, so good. Try that for networks. Did you allow your PC? Um, okay, so yeah, use a, use a thumbs up or. Oh God, it fails. All right, you're back with us. Okay, I don't know what's going on. It, it, this happens in my at night in my in my region. So, when it comes to um, developing into a leader, and, and Steve Garfin will tell you also, you know, because I, I remember when I was with Steve, he was. Uh, can you hear me? Now again, yes. So Steve Garfin was, and then we had a blackout. Okay, Steve. When Steve Garfin was, I was with him. He was the chief of spine surgery, and I know that he was. Um, remember the struggles he had. Now he's at the pinnacle of his. Alex, career. do you have any better way to connect um, with you with an iPad or something, or is it going to be the yeah, same? Yeah, yeah. As I'm speaking to you, um, I probably don't have this in my. Um, hold on one second, guys. Uh, do you have an Ethernet cable? Can you hardwire in? Yeah, I'm, I'm hard, the problem is I'm hardwire. I'm going to go to I'm going to go to the kitchen right. Now. So I'm going to disconnect this and go to the kitchen okay. of my house. Hold on one second. Good. We're, we're with you. This is how we have to do things around here. We have to figure yeah. out. And someone else just gave a suggestion that the Wi-Fi is not doing well. You can try your cellular. Do you have a hotspot on your phone that you can do it through? Yeah, I could do that too. We'll try this one little trick. Okay. We'll try it in my dark kitchen by my turtle cage. That looks even worse. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you see me? Yes. So okay. Good. This, good. this may work. This may work. Okay. So I talked about the leadership. I gave homage to Steve Garfin, but you probably didn't hear anything I said. <laughs> Steve, put your thumb up. Did you hear what I said? Okay, yes. good. Okay. So hit me with the next question. Now, going back to your, your younger days, um, or all your siblings uh, similarly motivated uh, to be at the top of their, their class, or did it just happen to you? Well, I have, I have very interesting brothers and sisters. When I was in high school, my, <laughs> my younger brother, who's seven years younger than me, was really never that motivated academically. And one day, my mother wakes him up and says, 
um, there's people downstairs that need to speak to you because you've got the highest raw score on the PSATs in the state of New Jersey. So he was this like little sort of genius kid. So they, they put him away and he, you know, never wanted to study. He went to Rutgers. And I remember him telling me, you know, I, I failed out of my computer science class. I said, why? He goes, because I never went to class. I would just read the book the week before the exam, but the professor tricked us and changed the exam location. So then he goes, he goes to Cornell MBA. He works for Madoff and he would come home and say, I can't stand those Madoff brothers. I fight with them every day because the returns they're getting, they don't make any sense. So he would always get the Trader of the Year award and the father, Madoff, loved him because his returns were so good. So he said, listen, Andrew, I'm gonna give you $25 million. I'm gonna put you in this room. I need you to come up with algorithms to beat the market. And he went into this little room and lost all the $25 million. And so now he then he went to, he got fired. He got fired before the fall of the Madoffs. He went to Jeffrey, he went to Deutsche Bank. Now he's a senior executive at Jeffrey's, which is one of the, the biggest uh, lending firms. My other brother went into Wall Street also, and he worked for BlackRock. And now he's a senior insurance guy. And then uh, my sister works in the city on Madison Avenue. So what? those, so they did well. My family did well. What made you want to go into medicine? Again, a very prominent individual in my life. I played football all my life. And um, <laughs> one of the football players, his name was Greg and Frank Ferraro. And their dad was a GP. And the father liked me. So he would always, like, hang, I, I was getting, I, I was a psychotic football player. You, I used my head. You know, you can't spear. I would spear in the locker room. I would spear in the cafeteria. <laughs> I, would, I would always do things wrong. And I was always injured and I had my first ACL uh, repair and he took care of me. And I said, you know something? I, I like this guy. He was cool. I want to be an orthopedic surgeon and I want to be a sports orthopedic surgeon. That's what I said. I said, I want to be what this guy does and hang out with the football team all the time. And that's how I became uh, interested in orthopedics. And then Jerry Kotler steered you to spine. Jerry was one of my favorite people in uh in orthopedics as well. You know, he, he was phenomenal, but he was, I remember he was, it was my first weekend on call at Thomas Jefferson. It was the 4th of July. I was a first year resident and, you know, he was old. He was an old guy when I was there. And we had four dislocated necks in one weekend. So remember, we we're the regional spinal cord injury center and in New Jersey beach, the beaches in New Jersey are slanted. So people body surf and they dislocate their neck. It's like the worst beaches in the country. So I remember these helicopters were landing at Jefferson and I'm, I'm a first year orthopedic resident. I had no understanding of anything. And he's like, okay, put tongs on. We got to reduce that. And you know, Kotler's attitude was you reduce everything. We'd go up to 120 pounds. He'd be like, okay, put bifemoral traction. I go, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? He goes, I need you to put femoral traction pins in so we could put them on a rotor rest bed and put traction on them. I go, oh my goodness, are you kidding this me? This your first weekend as an orthopedic resident. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's what we were doing. We were reducing all these things. And I remember I looked at him and I said, this guy's not young and it's two o'clock in the morning and he's standing next to me reducing these things. So of course, I said, I'm going to become a spine surgeon. This is cool. And that's how I became a spine surgeon. I mean, because he worked so hard. Yeah, he was, a, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, so, Alex, uh, Jack, let me just jump in with a question for Alex. If you weren't an orthopedic and spine surgeon, what other profession would you have gone into? Well, I always wanted to go into politics, but I soured. I, I woke up to the ugliness of politics during the 2016 election, and I saw how ruthless and mean people were to each other. And I, I got introduced to the fact that the media wasn't unbiased. I, I realized, I, again, I must have been sleeping up until 2016. I would go to work, get mad at my taxes, hope that a president came into office that cut my taxes. Then my taxes would go up. I'd go crazy. But in 2016, I started to watch this guy trash everyone on the podium. And it was funny to watch because we never saw it. I became interested. And then I, I got sucked into CNN. I got sucked into... MSNBC, I got sucked into Fox News. And then I said to myself, 
hey, no one's telling the truth. I said, wait a second, I, that's not true. Hey, wait a second. So both sides were lying. And, and I, I, I said, you know something? Uh, I gotta become a politician because I am gonna set it straight. So I, that would, I would probably go into politics. But now I, I tell my family that I said, you know, I'm gonna go into politics. And all my kids say, no, dad, we have so many skeletons in the closet. They will destroy our family. It's not, <laughs> it's not fair to us as a family. I said, probably right. Yeah, needless to say, I think you'd be uh, elected in a landslide. And the fact that somebody like you or Jack uh, doesn't run for president or for office is exactly the problem in our country. It's, uh, it's just uh, not the right uh, thing to do anymore for great people. So, uh, so you were a quarterback in uh, football. Was that your first leadership role or did you assume, uh, was that kind of put upon you or did you just know I'm the quarterback, I'm in charge, I'm going to take care of this, I know what to do? So did, I, I first started off as a middle linebacker because I was crazy. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I used to play with reckless abandons. So reckless abandons, would, a term we use in football. And, I, and I, I remember when I became, got my honors, you know, the, the state honors you get, and I first started off as a linebacker, and my mother goes, I, I don't like the way they describe the winners of who got the state honors. It says, quickness and a drooling willingness to hit people. <laughs> and that's, and they describe the people in the state of New Jersey. My mother goes, I, I'm not proud of you. I'm not, this is not appropriate. And then I became a quarterback. And then I got, then I had my, my series of knee injuries. I've had two ACL injuries. And as Steve can tell you, and if you guys see me, I limp all the time. I have a 30 degree flexion contracture and I'm not having surgery because if I have surgery, I'm going to get infected. Then I'm going to have a spacer. Then someone's going to say I have to fuse your joint. Then I'm going to get a pulmonary embolism. So I'm not going to have surgery on my knee. But I would have to say that if I was walking across the street and I was about to hit by, get hit by a truck, I'd be like, ah, who cares? <laughs> how bad my knee is right now but that was all from being a quarterback uh, Alex, transitioning or staying with the with the leadership thing um you know you've been you've done an amazing job with with the rothman orthopedic institute um it's a you've grown it into a large practice but you've remained nimble um you know things that a lot of other large practices haven't been able to do and um, you've expanded, you've continued to attract uh, um, really high level talent. How do you motivate um, the people that, that you're bringing in to um, stay interested in, in research and academics and, and staying at the top of their game? So that, that's a multifaceted. Oh no. You're out again, Alex. You're back. You're back. Okay. Number one, I believe in independence. I believe in independence for one thing. We can make decisions quickly. We can be nimble and we can make a right turn, left turn, whenever we have to. When you're, I used to work, I used to be full time at the University of Thomas Jefferson, and we would sit back and we'd, we'd sulk and we'd commiserate and we were miserable. If the dean went one way, if the dean went the other way, we had no control. So number one, I'd rather be in control and fail than not be in control and have a mediocre career. So number one, we fail often at the Rothman Institute. We make bad business decisions often at the Rothman Institute, but we realize it, we pivot, we react, and we choose a better path. I believe in a parliamentary democracy when it comes to leadership. So we have a board of 15 people and we, we, we devise the board in such a way that we have eight permanent board members. And to be an, a permanent board member, you have to be a full professor, you have to be dedicated to teaching, and you have to do research. So the mission never changes. And then we de de devise the compensation package to sort of incentivize what we want. You get paid if you present at national meetings, if you have high impact papers, if you have a professorship, you get monetary support. So like any compensation system, percent is you know productivity but the other 20 percent plus is based on the things that you value so we value teaching education and research and then the last part of the secret sauce is you don't do it alone you need to have partnerships so every region we go in we do a partnership with a large hospital system and we say listen it's cheaper for me to employ the orthopedic surgeons than it is for you i mean hr is a nightmare for these universities plus they have to decide where the research are going let me tell you what's gonna happen in the future. I'm gonna, I want everyone to think hard about my vision in the future. 
we see all these mergers with these universities and big hospital systems. And what do we see? We see the cost of care increasing. When all the different, Thomas Jefferson University has 14 hospitals. It's gonna have 18 hospitals. And you know what that means? It costs a lot of money to go to Thomas Jefferson University to get care. The government is surely the next several years gonna come in and say, either break it up like AT&T back in the 1960s, or say, listen, this is crazy. Independent practices will survive in the future. Even these big um, strategic partners that we have, if they change their direction, if they move away from MSK care, if they wanna to move to cardiology care, if they wanna to move to you know what, whatever other type of surgical care, you can be left behind. Two, we're gonna start seeing physicians unionize. You, you're not allowed to unionize as an independent physician, but you can through a third party messenger. Now that physicians are working for big hospital systems, they're losing their voice. And guess what happens? They begin to protest. I think you'll see in the next three to five years, the cost will be so high, people will get burned out by the system. And I think the RVU system is a very dangerous system. I mean, that's how else do you pay somebody? Their productivity. Productivity leads to burnout. There's m many other things involved. So I think we'll see unionization. You saw what happened in New York four weeks ago when the nurses went on strike because the nurses wanted to have a ways. Well, where does that money come from? The New York hospitals charge the union so much money to survive. I mean, it's crazy. Those large hospital systems are going to begin to weaken. Congress wants it to weaken. Two days ago, New York just pushed a single payer system bill. California does it all the time. Oregon does it all the time. The state of Pennsylvania last week presented it. It's to fight this craziness. And who's fighting the single? I mean, you and I don't want a single payer healthcare system, but either do the unions because they increase the cost of care. So I think independence is the model of the future. We can keep costs down, but we can't do it alone. We need to have a partnership, a capital partner. So the way we do it is I, I partner in Philadelphia with Thomas Jefferson. I partner in New York with NYU. I partner in Hudson County with CarePoint. I partner down in Florida with Advent Health. So we choose partners, but we do it alone. And I say to the universities, let me handle the orthopedic surgeons, all the nightmares, all the headaches, let me handle it. And I think that's the best way to go. So one of the things I want to uh, address is the relationship of neurosurgery um, and uh, the orthopedic spine group, which has been uh, both very successful, but one is still in traditional academia, that's neurosurgery, and orthopedics is in a private enterprise, a very successful privademic model. How do you uh, kind of keep a balance between those two specialties when they work in the same sandbox? How does that work interdisciplinary and from the many friendships and uh, collaborative projects that you have? So today, I'm sort of, when I came into the system, the orthopod did the fusion, the neurosurgeon did the decompression. So that's a 1980 model. We moved away from that model where we all, everyone became fellowship trained, everyone did the same thing. I think it's so foolish. Neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeons are brilliant. They are more comfortable within the dura. They're more comfortable in the brain, spinal cord stimulation, intradural tumors, things that you and I do not want to do complex dural tears, it's great to have one around. I make it a point every week to do a complex procedure with a neurosurgeon. So today the neurosurgeon and I, we did a horrible multi-revision, three column osteotomy, T4 to the pelvis, and I do with the neurosurgeon. I keep that relationship so strong. On Tuesday in office hours, an intradural tumor came, I'm not gonna do an intradural tumor, came in at L2, the guy was miserable. I pick up the phone, neurosurgeon takes it. I'm like, I'm not touching that. I always laugh when an orthopod says the ortho orthopedic spine guy goes, oh, I do intradural tumors. I go, are you out of your mind? I go, give that to a neurosurgeon. You're so much better at it than we are. But I feel as an orthopedic surgeon, I need a neurosurgeon more than a neurosurgeon probably feels he needs me because they, they were, were trained in the dura and then they learned deformity. We, we train in the biomechanics of the body. We've got a good three-dimensional sense and then we move into spine. And you, you see the debate all the time about how a neurosurgeon does seven times the amount of spine surgery by the time they graduate than an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, they, they do. And 70% of them specialize in spine when they... Frozen. We have to wait the magic 10 seconds. Yeah, it'll come. Okay, but we're back again. We're back. We're back again. Yeah. So, so it's a relationship that I think we should never lose, we should maintain. 
And my generation gets along really well with the neurosurgeons. What I've noticed is that the younger generation are not working well together. I, I noticed that because I look at, I have 18 spine surgeons in my group. The younger guys are not working together all the time. The older guys like myself, we worked with them all the time. We, I love working with them. I, I was on the phone today with Jim Harrod talking about a case. I was I operated with Siva Sigigensen in the operating room today. I love it. And, and plus you can bill, you can't bill with another orthopedic surgeon, but you can bill with another neurosurgeon, just the way the billing structure is. So I, I think it's a great thing. I, I love it. I think we should do more of it. We can learn from each other. It's interesting, Alex, because our mentors, the, the generation that trained us, um, were kind of always uh, at loggerheads between the orthopedists and the neurosurgeons competing in the ER, competing for spine trauma um, and, and not helping each other out. Then there's our generation, I think, has seen um, a really nice commingling of the specialties to the point where sometimes you're on a podium um, listening to other people and you can't tell what specialty they train through. We're all talking the same language. But it's interesting to hear you say that, that you're seeing the divide now again in the younger guys. Do you think that's just a competition um, kind of thing? They're competing for the same patient, so uh, not wanting to work together? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You may be right. Like the neurosurgeon I work with, his name is Ahilan Sivagensen. He did, his fel he did his fellowship up at HSS. He's only two years out. And I took him in. He and I are at the same hospital. He's the only neurosurgeon at the hospital I work with. I'm the only orthopedic spine surgeon at this hospital. It's a big hospital, but we're the only two spine surgeons. So I said, listen, on Wednesdays, let's do our cases together. And he was so happy because he just came out of practice. Even no one knew him. And then we just did cases together. And it's great because I love watching how he handles the dura. I love watching, you know, he'll, I, gave, I did a spinal cord tumor with him. I just, I go, I'm not going to do that. He cut, cut open the door and I'm like vomiting on the side and he's pulling the thing out. I'm like, oh my God, that's the spinal cord. So, you know, I just, I just thought it was great to watch him operate. He was fantastic. And, and I, and I enjoy it. And it gives me energy to work with him. It gives me energy to work with the neurosurgeon. So um, I, I hate systems when I go into different systems and I say, well, how do you do call? They say, well, the neurosurgeon does anything for a spinal cord injury. And I roll my eyes and go, that's stupid. You should all you should take call together. Or, you know, trauma only goes to this type of, that's ridiculous. Everyone should work together. Now, he, here's my vision also. I could see a program where the, for the first three years, we do an orthopedic residency program. And then year four, you commit early to spine in both neurosurgeon orthopedic surgery. So we have a combined residency program. So just like plastic surgery does now, three years are general and the last two to three years is specialized in plastic surgery. So you don't have to do it when you, so what we should do where we're not gonna get into the chairman who take all the money from spine and keep it to themselves. We should do, we should make a combined residency program. The first three years is whatever orthopedics does, all the basics. And then the last two to three years, we, we learn how to do our own surgical approaches anteriorly. We learn the, the basics of vessel repair, which none of us have. We learn how to do intradural work and we all graduate together as a spine surgeon. That's my vision over the next 10 years. And, I, and I've looked at every single model to do that. Now, what's stopping that from happening is money, 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 money. Because- And, poli and politics. Yeah. And, and then Alex, who's gonna be the certifying board? Yeah, so so I, I figured that out. Like orthopedic surgery, you need a certain amount of cases. You could still certify neurosurgery stuff. If you do, you'll be able to get as much as much as you need. Like if you look at a typical residency program, the last eight months is elective. I mean, you could you could literally take a year off of a residency program. I mean, if you look at what residents do nowadays, they they go off and do this. They go. To, you could you can consolidate it and do it. So you could still get an orthopedic certification. You still get a neurosurgical, but then you get a spine certification where you both have the same background. Because as I said before, neurosurgeons do seven times the amount of spine that an orthopedic resident does in training. Uh, uh, another big trend change right now, and that's this MIS and enabling technologies chapter. So this has become something that's a, a, a significant force transcending both of our specialties and enabling technologies, especially as 
Uh, we have adjuvants towards helping us do more precise surgery, so the advertisements claim. And um, uh, basically, MIS surgery is a sales job to make the, the painful surgery aspect less intimidating for patients and get more patients into surgery. We see the role and the hope of these enabling technologies and less invasive technologies as a marketing campaign versus a true advancement of care. Okay, so every meeting we go to, we have the guy on the left that says, I can do MIS deformity. And the guy on the right says, no, you can't. And then they have the brawl. And then they show all the failures of MIS. So let me tell you why I was not an avid adopter of MIS. I hate radiation. Okay. I've seen seven of my partners. And in fact, my partner gets cellular cancer. So two of my partners, MIS guys, cellular cancer. Number three, number two, major marketing. I I'm sort of, I, I, the marketing is out there. It's crazy. Like I use the robot on Wednesdays. I have the robot. I use it. The hospital wanted to advertise. I go, you don't advertise for the robot. I said, if you can advertise for everything, it just says Thomas Jefferson has the robot. Don't say Alex Vaccaro has the robot. Cause that's what I hate when people do that. You're the robot guy. You're the MIS guy. Three, you give me an operation that takes 50% longer. I hate it. So when I started to do the two really disectomies, I was like, okay, I could do that in no time at all. But now I'm going to get fluoro, put the tube in, move the tube around, clean the tube out, fluoro more. I go, that's a waste of time. And then I, I, I thank the Lord when all the papers came out from, from um, JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine that said that is, there was no difference in outcome. Now, we do know there's a definite difference in infection rate. Infection rate is definitely less. Um, soft tissue manipulation is less but long-term outcomes are about the same. So I wasn't an advocate. I said, I'm not into it. Now, the funny thing is this robot thing comes along and I kind of like the robot. I, I really do. I, I do a lot of deformity work with the robot. And now I almost like am smoking a cigar in the operating room going, I'm the number one MIS guy. Watch this. I press a button. The thing takes me right to the pedicle. I put the screw in. I go, that is the most MIS of anyone around here. I didn't even use a tube. I didn't use that. that so, so the enabling technologies have allowed us to skip the harmful radiation. Now, at the cost of money, very expensive, the cost of disposables, and the cost of losing the, the tactile feel back you get when you have a three-dimensional sense of anatomy. So that's the problem, because I have friends of mine that if the robot isn't working, they cancel their- Nope, we're frozen. I love the freeze frames of Alex. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't a good look. That was not a good look. That, that, okay, but I, I have friends of mine that cancel their surgery if the robot isn't working. So this is what you got to do. It's like anything else. You have to learn with your three dimensions, with your hands, with your eyes, with your feel. You know, when I do deformity surgery, I don't do imaging. I just look at the anatomy and I use my pedicle and I kind of feel it go in. And people are like, oh, you're not using x-ray fluoro? I go, no, I'm not going to use fluoro. I'll do it at the end of the case where I put all my screws in. And then like, oh my God, we use fluoro. I go, that's not the way I trained. I trained understanding the anatomy. I, you know, I, my preoperative study, when I do a deformity case, I do an imaging, uh, an MRI, and I do transaxials to the pedicle. So I know if it's a dysplastic pedicle. I know where the aorta is. I know where the great vessels are. I knew that that pedicle is not going to work for me to get a screw in. I know it before I do it. And then I'm in the operating room and I just know it. So then I, I feel it doesn't work, I go to the next pedicle. Now, I'm really loving, um, and again I, again, I take it for your question, you're not a big robot fan, but I kind of like the robot a lot because like every Wednesday, I do like a psychotic revision deformity case where I'm like, I'm gonna put three iliac screws over here, two over here, and I wouldn't do that if I, if I didn't have the robot because you just, you just pull the screws in the machine and the machine and the robot puts it in for you. And I'm like, that is really cool. Like you can do some really cool stuff with the robot that I wouldn't sit there with fluoro and do. Like you could do a lot of really complex pelvic work with the robot. Have you done is it? it? Yeah. Izzy, is Maybe it really not. that easy? You, you're telling us it's hard. You got to pre-program it. Alex is making it sound like it's a piece of cake. No, 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 no. It is. Let, let me tell you something. I don't even know how to use my iPhone. I have a hard time making a phone call it is pretty easy once you learn how to do it. A lot easier than electronic medical records, a lot easier than Epic. It's pretty easy once you get it down. And then, you know, and I, I Jack, I could, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to do it. 
my, my workflow. I mean, I have a, I, yeah, I mean, literally you scrub, they do the spin. When you're scrubbing, you come in, you, you merge it. You, I mean, it's pretty simple. And, uh, and then and what I do is it's, I, I do the same. I make a midline incision on the soft tissue for deformity. And I just move the skin and I put the screws to the fascia. So it's like, it's like super MIS. And I'm not even an MIS surgeon. I crack myself up. That's great. You know, before Izzy, I how come you didn't make it sound so easy for us? <laughs> this is uh, this is Alex's stage tonight. I'll get my turn. <laughs> so, so um, since we talked about education, should residents be trained in formal open techniques before they use enabling techniques or uh, venture into MIS or robots or whatever nav? Because we have many fellows now who come 100%. to our place because we still do traditional. Well, you know, the world of education is changing. We'll, we'll be doing, I mean, just think, when I was on the board of the academy, I, we had to choose the best AR, VR system. You put these helmets on. I had to look at 50 companies. You're, you're inside of a body. You're inside a body. You're feeling the body. So maybe you can learn how to do open surgery in a VR, AR world where you can feel everything, and then you move on to the robot. But you clearly have to have an understanding of three-dimensional anatomy before you rely on a robot to do your spine surgery. Because as I said before, people are canceling their procedure. We just lost you again, Alex. Je uh, Scott, did you have a question? I actually had your hand. Scott Blumenthal, did you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Hi, Alex. Hey, Scott. Uh, so this is kind of along the lines and and, and being, being a thought leader that people listen to and we had we just finished our journal club and we kind of touched on this conversation. And that is the similarity between cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, and how there are certain procedures that we're as surgeons not interested in, but are being picked up by interventionalists. And in fact, there are some procedures that we just don't think are have any merit, but they're rampant in the interventionalist world. What's your, what's your view on, on kind of where that's heading and are we giving the farm away by not trying some of these, you know, maybe less standard things that we think are beneath us? So, so let's look carefully at both specialties and let's look at what has migrated away from us to the pain people and interventional. We started off doing kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. If you and I were getting paid a lot of money to do those procedures, we never would have abandoned those procedures. But this government, as it got a code, it went down to $400, it went down to $300. We pushed it away because to an orthopedic spine surgeon, that type of reimbursement wasn't a lot. So we, we passed that away. If you look at the things that we've relegated to the pain people, it's because they weren't paying us. I'll give you an example. Interspinous process spacers. If you do it in an ASC, if you do a, a laminal foraminotomy, you get paid more money than if you do a laminal foraminotomy and put an interbody spacer in for some weird reason. So we stopped doing interbody spacers. And now you see the non-operative people. So we've given those procedures away for the one reason we were not getting paid for it. And I always talk to Jack about this. There's two other procedures that we do. If you do a cervical laminoplasty, which is much more difficult technically than a cervical laminectomy infusion, it's more difficult, but you get paid less money. That is a barrier to adoption of that procedure. If you do a cervical arthroplasty, which is much more complicated because you have to position it the correct way. You have to choose the appropriate stable prosthesis, but you get paid less than a bone graft and a plate. You're not going to do it. So we see that with a lot of these sort of anesthesiologists, pain managers coming into areas. Now, the downside of them doing it, they don't have the appropriate anatomic training. They don't understand the biomechanics. Um, they have a difficult time getting into trouble. Now they can turn to you and I and say, well, listen, if you cut the aorta, you can't get into trouble either. These lateral approaches we do. So the argument goes both ways, but I think we've abandoned things that we didn't make much money, which is different than cardiology. Cardiology, you, you had the, the cardiac surgeons opening up the chest, which is morbid, and someone invented a safer way to do a procedure. So I don't think they'll replace this when it comes to doing a complex decompressive procedure, um, a deformity correction, stuff like that. You're not going to get a, a, an anesthesiologist doing it because I watch the anesthesiologist do these procedures where they percutaneously place an interbody spacer. You don't see a fusion. You don't see, they, they don't even understand the biomechanics. How about the advertisement? I think it's called the Minuteman where they literally have an unstable spinal thesis and the anesthesiologist puts an interspinous clamp on that bone graft. I'm like, I mean, they just don't, they don't get it because they don't understand it. 
but there's other people that do get it. So it's a complex problem that, and we, we have to keep an eye on it. Never, never be too prideful that you're gonna say, oh, it'll never be taken over. If we do simple procedures, I'm assuming that the interventionalists will eventually do those procedures. It'll happen. It's all about money. And industry will help them. Because remember in industry, when it came to percutaneous cement augmentation said, we're not training, we're not training anyone besides orthopedic surgeons. And now they're training everybody. Interspinous process, we're not training. Now they're training people. Now we see it with SI fusion now. We see the companies training the interventionalists to do SI joint fusions percutaneously, especially with robotic guidance. So we're seeing them relegate that to another specialty. Alex, what, what, what about like? the mild procedure where they're actually going in the interventions with the kerosene blindly? They put a little bit of dye in, see the epidural space. They have no idea what they're doing. Well, it's interesting. I, I was asked a couple of times to speak at an anesthesia meeting. And I watched all the anesthesia. I'll just get up there and talk about how they're killing it with the mild procedure. And I sat there in the audience listening to, oh, we're making a ton of money. We're doing this. We're doing that. And you and I both know that we see these procedures in our office and I can't see the incision. And I, I'm like, the guy didn't get any better. And I, I look at the MRI and there's severe tricuperimental stenosis. I'm like, okay, that was a problem and stuff like that. No, you, you're right. That, that procedure itself has received support from non-surgeons in terms of the literature. And it, and it has really not done well outside of that group of people. And in and, and my town in Philadelphia, a lot of people come in and say they had the mild procedure and it didn't work at all. So I'm sure it works when the pathology is minimal, where well, you and I would probably say we're not gonna do surgery. I'm sure it's effective there with a little bit of help by the placebo effect, but it clearly doesn't work for more complex procedures. But if you go to their meetings, they are big fans because why? They get paid a lot of money for it. It's a surgical procedure. Hey, Alex, in the last 15 minutes, it's so nice of you to join us. Uh, it's so cool to see you and you're so animated and so full of life and ideas. Uh, looking back a little bit on your life of academics, what are the one or two most favorite articles in your just about thousand publications? What, what do you look back on and say, this was cool, this made a big difference, or wow, this was really neat? Okay, so um, I, I remember them clearly. Um, one or two years out, while we were just playing around with lumbar pedicle screws, and I did that two-part JBGS article on thoracic pedicle screw fixation. This is before Sook, in Korea started to do it all the time. I, I did it and I and I did it and I cut all the cadavers up and I showed how close you get to the aorta. And I'm like, wow, this is really scary. Be careful. Think about this 20 times before you do it. Now we're literally in the operating room putting like just routinely putting the thoracic pedicle screws in. But I, that was like one of my seminal papers that I wrote. The other paper that I loved is the timing of surgery in spinal cord injury. Mm. Where at my hospital, the older neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons we're waiting 72 hours to do surgery. And I, I, I said to myself, why do they wait 72 hours? And I know why. If something comes in Thursday or Friday, they're not operating over the weekend. They're doing it Monday morning. So everything got done 72 hours. So I said, well, why don't we just randomize it? And I randomized it. And we found that early surgery was better. And that led to the, the, uh, the failings paper that we did together. And you were part of that paper. So I think timing of surgery and spinal cord injury and that thoracic pedicle screw I got a kick out of. I, I just, I like those two papers because those are things that I enjoy doing. It, it really changed what we do in medicine. But I like doing, like we, we publish a lot at Jefferson and uh, I, I like doing papers that change the way we think. Change, and, and I'm doing one now, but I can't tell. I, a friend of mine got sued and I looked at all the data and I was like, wow, that would have made the same mistake that guy made. And then I said, wait a second. And I'm devising an experiment now to see how to prevent what happened to my friend not to happen to anyone else. And it could have, it was like a piano falling out of the sky. I saw everything he saw in the imaging studies and the decision he made is exactly what I would have made, but he was wrong. He was wrong. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm doing a research paper now to show how to never let that happen again. Because I would have fallen. That's, that's what I like doing. I like, I like looking at problems like that and solving it. Alex, how about in surgery? What's, what are your favorite operations? What things do you, do you really like um, and look forward to the morning uh, when you get out of bed? What, what's, your, what's your good okay. things to do? So you and I, everyone on this phone loves it when a patient wakes up and has tears in their eyes and say, you changed my life. Now, what is the one procedure 
that is so easy to do where people say, you changed my life. They send seven more patients to you. They probably bring you wine, maybe cigars. A simple discectomy with horrible searing leg pain. Oh my God. You do it. This, I do a lot of deformity surgery. You do a little discectomy that takes you 15 minutes. It changes the life. They see you in restaurants. Oh, I got the bill. I got the bill. No, no, not the bill. Bring the bill over to me. I got that's, the bill. That's your Roth with training. Yeah. And then, and then you then you see a patient that was a pretzel that is now standing up straight. They're like, I still have my pain syndrome. Uh, I go, but you were bent over looking at the ground when you're walking. Yeah, I know, but I, I still have pain in my back. You know, you're not getting anything for that. But that simple discectomy, we're taking out a cervical fragment anteriorly. Oh, I tell everybody. You need a lot of those every day. And then a few, then the deformity surgeries, but you need the home runs. It makes you feel so much better. That's awesome. Hey, how, so uh, we had this actually as one of the questions by one of our neurosurgical colleagues, uh, Mariela Perez, and she basically said endoscopy. Is that actually something reasonable or is that just a additional variation of industry with massive non-pass-through costs uh, that is just worthless? Okay, as you know, uh, froze. As you know, as you know, it's gaining traction. Okay, so let's say endoscopy. And you know, I know it's gaining traction because my partners who are orthopedic spine surgeons are like taking endoscopy courses. And I am laughing because let me take you back to 1991 when Parvis Camden down the street from me said, hey, technique. So I went to the graduate hospital and I watched Parvis Cambin fluoroscopy floor, floor, go in the disc on one side, go in the disc. And I watched him because I watched closely as I pulled a disc fragment into this. And I was like, oh my God, that took forever. And then I watched how Matthews do the upstairs procedure where he introduced the MED, which is almost like a form of endoscopy. Then I watched the endoscopy wars in the early 90s. And then I watched the amount of money for all the cameras, all the tools, uh, docking in part in, in cam and triangle. And I'm like, eh, I'm just going to make a small incision, take the disc out. So I said, I'm not going to do it. Now I'm seeing it again. My younger spine surgeons are doing endoscopy courses and I start laughing and I go, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to do this for a little bit for maybe you know three or four months. And then I'm going to mock you out and the nurses are going to laugh at you. And then they're going to say how long it takes you to do surgery. And you're probably going to do a small one inch incision, take a disc out because I mean, you're making it more. Yeah. Alex, you froze. Yeah. Uh, okay. I see. So yeah. I'm open minded, I'm open minded to anything, but I've been through the endoscopy. You've been through the endoscopy. We've all, we've seen it already. I, I, I lived with the head of the endoscopy world, Parvis Cambin in Philadelphia. And it was very popular, then went out. Now, you could say, but Alex, in Korea, everyone does endoscopy. They do endoscopy. And I said, yeah, I just haven't really seen people have killed it in endoscopy. So I, I don't, again, I don't want to throw stones because remember they went after Jackson when he developed neoarthroscopy. Oh, that'll never work up in Toronto, Canada. And then they became, but I've, this, this has cycled through already. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, but in fairness, Alex, the, the instrumentation is much better now. Um, and I think the younger... Generation is a lot more slick um, with uh, visual, you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional work because they grew up playing video games. So um, there's definitely less tissue trauma, you know, and you can still do the same thing, maybe with a little bit better visualization. So I, I, I would I would give it a little bit more of a chance than, yeah. uh, than you're alluding to. And and I'm Alex, gonna, I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm going to keep an open Alex, mind. Alex, we we have a young surgeon that has now done 150. Used to take him three hours. Now he can do them in about an hour. And I venture to say that Jack, myself, and several of the other partners, we send them all our simple disc. And it is amazing. Well, no, I got to say, you know, when we get someone in our society that's really good at it, we have to go visit him or have him do what, like a, a Seattle Science Foundation. We, we have to watch him do it, like on a, on a patient, like bring him into that and just watch him do it. And then maybe we'll change and we'll say that's a great idea. You know, yeah. I'm open to anything. We've even sent him some of our partners for surgery. <laughs> So it, it does work. <clears throat> hey, Alex, we're uh, heading into the final five minutes. So quick fire things. So, uh, and we wanted to see also if Dr. Garfin had any questions, comments, big picture perspectives. Uh, 
I have been fascinated, not just by your academic work and your surgical acumen, your leadership and business qualities, but the work-life balance. And so just in a nutshell, we just before we started, we saw your kids on your lap and everything. How do you handle all this? How do you handle this incredible workload, uh, this performance on a professional basis, but then a beautiful family? Well, I'm going to say something that got Steve probably mad at me. Steve, in my early career, would be like, Alex, I'm really disappointed. You go to a meeting, you get there late, and you leave after nine minutes after you give your talk. And I'd be like, dude, I got to stay married. And again, I didn't stay married. I got divorced. So even doing that, I got divorced. So I tried during the week to get home by 530. And then I hang out. This true story. Four nights a week, I have a business meeting at 7 p.m. And it goes for 45 minutes at a restaurant. And they know exactly what I'm ordering. I walk in, they see me, they walk out, they put the food down on the table and I'm done in 45 minutes and I go home. So I come home five, 5.30, I hang out with the kids, I play basketball, I do whatever I want. So every day I'm with the kids. And when I do meetings, I do the meetings the way you, everyone in this, you know how I do meetings. I come in right before my talk, I give my talk, I high five you guys and I'm out the back door when you're not looking. <laughs> so I stay married the second time. That's what I do. At least you learned, Alex. Exactly. Hey, Dr. Garfin, Steve, uh, any thoughts of this disciple of yours that you want to share? Any, uh, any semi-embarrassing or uh, adulating thoughts from the San Diego perspective? No, I, I don't know if you can see me. I don't know if you can see me or not. I have this huge smile on my face. <laughs> yeah, we do see you, Steve. Thank you. And I did when he was a fellow. And I have done it every year of his life since then. He is who he is. You can't control him. The good thing is he goes to bed at nine o'clock. Exactly. And, and he gets up at four. That's part of his routine. And we all love him for it. Yeah, and he's made love it work. You, love, you, love you, Steve. And I'll just add one, one thing about minimally invasive, which, you know, I mean, I'm not doing that per se when you're talking about mild and other stuff. It, it may not just be the money. It may be it doesn't work is why we don't do it. <laughs> now, I'm not that insensitive. <laughs> hey, one more question. So uh, you're also, and we don't want to go into any current uh, things like uh, football scores or so, but how is uh, team management for a uh, team doctor nowadays compatible with uh, regular practice? I mean, there have been recent well-publicized events. So how can you handle that nowadays in addition to everything else? And how is there a future for sports medicine doctors who are high profile people? Well, you probably read yesterday that the Rothman Institute got hit for 14.5 million on a malpractice case and someone who had surgery at another institution and then saw, I guess, my, my sports medicine guys like months later and Can you hear me? Okay, back again. Yeah. yeah, so just like that, just like that. So the Rothman doctors didn't do surgery on this player and the verdict was $43.5 million. I mean, that's crazy. So that's a, that's a problem with tort. I mean, that you can't afford that. That could put practices out of business. So of course there will be an appeal. Um, and I won't get into the detail. You're, very, you're back. Very, you're very, back. very frustrating, isn't it? Very yeah. frustrating. We're almost there. Um, but, but anyway, it, that's that's a downside of being a professional because you, sometimes you get you get tagged, and uh, and that's an issue we're dealing with right now. Yeah, but I think it also points out a little bit of a weak spot in the current system because you're talking about pretty sophisticated um, um, aspects of of surgical technique that that at a high level, super specialists are, I can't get uh, agreement on. And then you're asking civilians to make oh, a decision yeah. which they do in, in a few hours. And how is that really fair? How is that appropriate? I, I agree. It's, it's a complex situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alex, Jens, you want to thank our host, our friend? I know. I mean, uh, so first of all, it's your bedtime, uh, Alex. It's so cool to see you and animated and uh, just so full of ideas and visions. And you've inspired us. You've led us. 
um, and you've really enriched our specialty as a whole in so many ways. So thanks for coming on tonight. Um, we're all very glad to have you uh, in our friendship circle, but also as a leader. And um, again, you've made Spine a better world. So thanks to Dr. Garfin for having coached you along and all the mentors that you mentioned and to your parents who had the pleasure and privilege of meeting and uh, the phenomenal family that you have uh, around you. So thanks for doing this and any final parting wisdoms to the world around you, the many fans who've written whose uh, uh, questions we couldn't get to uh, are most welcome at this yes. point. Here's the most important thing. My most important mention is get an internet connection that works. <laughs> This is crazy. Get an internet. I, I am. I am going to go crazy after this. I'm going to call my guys. I'm going to call Comcast that I spent 450 a month on and figure out why this doesn't work in my house. All right. But thank so you. We, we, we invite you back for part two. You got to have a better connection. Absolutely. I love you guys. Thank Thanks, you very much. All right. Take care, thank Alex. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.